Hello and welcome to the Swine Disease Reporting System. This is report number 72. We're going to cover the findings from the previous month, the month of January uh, 2024. My name is Edison Magalhães here at the SDRS podcast. Hello, my name is Giovanni Trevis at the SDRS. Hi, my name is Guilherme, also at SDRS. And Daniel Linhares is also with the SDRS. And today, like I mentioned, we're going to cover the findings from the previous month in the, from the SDRS project. But also, we have the pleasure of having here today uh, Dr. Brigitte Mason uh, joining the podcast for this month. Dr. Mason is currently a health assurance veterinarian at Country View Family Farms. Dr. Mason has plenty of experience in animal health management, disease management, and control, and she'll talk about the SDRS monthly findings and also about some of these the, the strategies regarding swine disease management in, in farms. Dr. Mason, uh, happy to have you here again. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to be here, especially on, I hear it's the sixth anniversary of Correct. doing these editions. So it's really exciting to be part of this and the information that you guys have brought. Thank you, Dr. Mason, for coming with us on this sixth anniversary of the SDRS. That's true, 72 reports already. So before we move on to pick up your brain, Guilherme, could you provide us the update from the SDRS from the month of January 2024? Yeah, Giovanni, sure. Let's start with the first page of the PERS virus, that we are having a moderate decrease in the overall positivity of PERS, uh, about 4%, and we get like 24% of the submissions positive. And this is mainly driven by the winter market category, that we also had a moderate decrease in the positivity of the submissions. And when we look to the cyclical or, or our forecast model, the first weeks of PERS were also like below the expected, but right now coming back off, we've been inspected. But we don't have only good news when you look for the CT values of the submissions. They dropped since the November uh, of last year, 2023, and they maintain in these low CTs around 25 to 26, the average CT of the submissions that might indicate that something is going on in the field, not only the percentage of positive, but also this lower CT. And did you find anything related to genetic sequence? Yeah, when we start to look to the PERS virus R5 sequence, we saw that over 55% of these sequences were coming as from the L1C. And when we break down this information to see specifically each of these uh, lineage, the L1C.2, the RFOP124, that we had a detected in 2022 in the second semester. In 2023, was kind of quiet. But in December of 2023, and right now in January, we have a, a increase in the number of these sequences coming as this specific classification that we have over 80 sequences right now in these two months that are classified as L1C.2 or RFLP124. And how about the L1C.5? The L1C.5 is still like the one that's more predominant detected. We are having a, still having a lot of cases and that we have this specific lineage classified for, the, for PERS follow up by the L1, L1A or RFLP174, that is the second one most detected. Just so. reminding people that the L1C.5 is the new name for what we previously knew as the 144 correct, the yeah. variant run, right? Yeah, yeah. correct. Anyway, very atypical situation in the field. Low detection of pulse virus, but with very low CT values, and L1C is the predominant strain being detected on the sequencing. Any comments from the advisory group for pulse virus, Liam? Yeah, for our advisory group, uh, some of them might indicate that this decrease in positivity and also in the number of cases might be because of the, the production systems. When they see that the cell farm, for example, is already positive, they stop to, to test the flow going to the winter market. So we decrease the number of positive, for, for example, but it's not indicated that we have less activity of pores in the field. Thank you for sharing that. And how about entire coronavirus? For enteric coronavirus, PED is having a moderate increase in the cell farm positivity, uh, increased 4% comparing the last month of December of 2023. And when we look to the Delta coronavirus, we, we also have an increase, but then in the winter market category and not in the cell farm, around 4% as well. But when we look to specifically to a state level to look how this, where this positivity is coming from, for PED, for example, uh, Iowa, Oklahoma, and also North Carolina is the, are the main states that these positive cases are coming. So PD is spiking up in the last few weeks there, and regional activities start to picking up. So good time to reinforce by security and by containment practices there to avoid disease entrance or 
have uh, spread across different sites. And how about the other pathogens? For the other pathogens, for influenza A virus, we have a, a, a news that we're going to bring here for this SDRS report that we had one new chart. That is the, the forecast model for uh, influenza. That was a request from our stakeholders. We had this chart for PERS, for the entire coronavirus, and also for mycoplasma. And now you can take a look for this influenza chart. Uh, as a reminder for the audience, if you are not familiar, it's the chart that we have the 95% uh, confidence interval that's represented by the blue shade. And you can see like the red line that uh, represent the percentage of positive that we are having currently and the blue line that represented the predicted value. So when you look to this chart right now for influenza, and you see that the red line is going below or above this, this 95% confidence interval, it seems that something is different, it's not expected for this specific year. Any specific information for disease diagnosis? Yes, for sure. Uh, for disease diagnosis, for the top three pathogens, there is no surprise. They are the same from the beginning of the winter. PERS virus, the one that is most, uh, that have the larger number of cases, followed by Streptococcus suis and also influenza A virus. But what caught our, our attention is that Actinobacillus suis, for the first time since 2023, is listed as the top 10 diseases that are most diagnosed here in the ISU VDL. And most of these cases were concentrated in December and also January right now. So something might, might happen to have this increased number of cases. Mm -hmm. So potential activity of ASU is going on there. Correct. Very good. Thanks, Giovanni Guilherme, for the, the updates from the previous month of the FDR, SDRS. Now let's move to our discussion with Dr. Mason. And Dr. Mason, as you, as you saw, we, we discussed this uh, recent activity in the last year, at the end of the last year for PERS, speci specifically having a decreased uh, detection, uh, but also we have also lower uh, CT values. Uh, so with, with that information, and we know that some of those sequences, the, the L, L1C5 variant sequences, they happen in the eastern states of the U.S. Uh, we had detection in Tennessee, Indiana, uh, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and, and Ohio. And specifically in Ohio, we had the highest numbers of these L1C5 variant uh, detection since emergence. So can you share uh, how these PERS trains, uh, how you are seeing that, how that that strain reached the eastern states and how can we avoid more detections? Yeah, so it's actually really interesting with these emergent uh, PER strains that we'll see, let's say, in Iowa or Nebraska out in really what we call the true Midwest, um, in that it typically takes them about a year to a year and a half, and then we will start finding them detected in what I'd call the Eastern Corn Belt, right? So Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that region, we can see just that delay of time, and um, we've seen it with other variants that have come out or different per strains. Um, for us, we always ask that question because we do know there's that lag in time and then we're going to experience the same thing as what the Midwest industry is experiencing. Um, so when we start, you know, researching what about our area could be different or what causes that delay or increase our risk for that, um, we look at typically a couple things. So guilt purchases. Mm. If we are, you know, moving gilts in from that region into Indiana or Ohio or Pennsylvania, for example, we've seen gilt purchases and bringing them, um, whether it's just because we're transporting them through those states or whether they're coming from higher density areas that have a higher risk of, you know, becoming infected in transport or infected prior to transport. We've seen that as actually a pretty common way that we tend to get this variant. And the experience that I had with this particular variant, that was actually how um, we brought it into the region. Um, and then, you know, certainly too, looking when we're doing wean pig purchases and different things like that, we certainly can accidentally, you know, we always try to do our due diligence, but we can accidentally bring it into the area through those types of movements. Um, and I think that actually has been, for at least our experience, the top two ways that we have brought variants that we haven't seen, you know, previously in the region into the region. Um, and it really, you know, just supports having that additional good guilt testing program prior mm -hmm. to bringing those animals into the region to decrease the, li you know, it's not a zero, but it certainly decreases the likelihood of entering a new variant to a region that hasn't seen it before. What will be a good uh, a monitoring program that you would recommend for that guilt testing? Yeah, so it's really going to be specific to what works for your system and what you can actually get executed. 
Um, I think it also really depends on what type of isolation you have available to those animals versus what you don't. So we are sometimes restricted in the fact that we don't have a ton of isolation available to us. So we do tend to have to bring gilts right in from the finisher right into the sow unit um, GDU and those sow unit GDUs are attached. Um, so we do typically like to do, we do testing two weeks uh, prior to movement and then um, as close to movement as possible. So typically we can get about 48 to 24 hours prior to movement. Um, and that's at least lended us fairly good results in us not delivering positive animals um, either to the sow unit or to the region. Um, we have a pretty heavy testing uh, regimen of flu, PERS, uh, PDTGE, at least on oral fluids. Um, and then, you know, certainly sal, we request sow unit testing as far as the myco status goes um, for some more reliability on that front. But a big piece is going to be what do you have available? Um, what can you get executed? What does your transportation look like? Um, we, you know, depending on the constraints, sometimes you might have to do 72 hours prior to movement. Um, and then we also use clinical signs of those finishers to indicate whether or not we have any concerns about moving those animals. So increase in mortality versus increase in coughing or looseness, um, those kinds of things to try to divert if it, our testing regimen alone can't do it. So combination of clinical signs and some oral fluid testing? Sorry, could you say that again? So, so in, in summary, it's a combination of uh, clinical signs and oral fluid testing of those guilds? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's our predominant form. And just the, um, also I would say the duration of time before your testing to movement and then having a good understanding of historically what does that site look like. So that's mm -hmm. why we do the two weeks prior. Mm -hmm. So as we start to talk about these movement of pers wise across regions thank you for sharing that and this practice to reduce the potential opportunity for introducing pers wise in the 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 breeding herd from incoming goods i have another question here first we talked about that background on the pers wise being having lower detection but at the same time the ct values are pretty low that means lots of virus concentration there so first I want to pick your brain here of what can be contributing for that. And then could you elaborate a little bit more of what would be the good practice that the swine industry could be doing to help increase the activity and transmission of pers virus, not only for the uh, GDUs to breeding herd, but also for uh, growing sites and breeding herds across all the industry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think it's multifactorial, some of the information that we're starting to see, because I do think we all know that the swine industry has had a relatively difficult year um, and some change uh, this last year. And so we do know that people have exited sows and those sows that people have exited have tended to be some of the sicker herds within the industry or herds that have been relatively difficult to keep clean or keep you know, productive due to PERS or other challenges. Um, so I think that has played into the overall decrease of submissions in one sense, um, that some of those sick herds just don't exist anymore. I think the other piece too has when we look at how we've changed some of our herd closure strategies, whether you do a delayed herd entry uh, or herd closure, or whether you do a delayed movements from a strict McMurvel versus a modified versus we're only gonna do that when we're you know 20 weeks into a closure. All of those are also probably influencing your testing strategy because there's definitely value in testing, but sometimes we know for the first 20 weeks, they're probably gonna be pretty hot so does that really change my plan? So if you're looking and saying, you know, it's not gonna change my plan, you might decrease the overall amount of times that you test. Um, so then I also think though, because of that, we probably end up testing only herds that are really, really sick, which is why we then see those lower CT values overall where they're resting more comfortably in the 20s. If we're not doing as much surveillance testing and we're doing more pinpoint, these are sick herd testing. Um, so I think some of all, 
like I said, I think there's probably more than one factor that's playing into why we're seeing some of these responses from a diagnostic perspective. I also think that the virus is really good at changing and, you know, we know it mutates really well because we have all of these different open mm -hmm. reading frame patterns and names for it. Um, so one of the characteristics might be that it is just replicating at a faster pace than what we've seen other viruses do in the prior years. Um, so that's certainly the virus itself could have changed why we're being able to detect it at such a higher level or lower CT count than we have in the past. Um, so I think those, you know, really answer kind of the first half of that question. And then definitely what good practices is the swine uh, industry doing now that might help us with some decreased activity? Um, you know, certainly I think we're becoming more and more aware of wean to finish biosecurity. And when you look at where those of us who really struggle with PERS and, you know, constantly having breeding herds reinfected, a lot of it is because we have a large wean to finish population right by our sow units. And so really inherently focusing on that. And it's, you know, the basic practices every day, following clean, dirty lines, making sure that we're changing our boots and coveralls. If we have the ability to shower, showering in, showering out, not sharing equipment when we're dealing with, whether we're dealing with rendering or we're dealing with compost, um, different things like that, really having dedicated equipment to sites. Um, and then I also think, you know, manure managing and how we manage hauling manure from site to site, um, keeping equipment clean, um, having downtime to go different places. I think all of those activities, which the swine industry is certainly focused in on, and we can see it with the different projects from where we're testing wean to finish sites to understand their positivity, um, you know, plus just some of the discussions around transport and wean to finish biosecurity. I think those are really some of the activities that are in the end, though they're not specifically focused for the, you know, breeding herd. In the end, they'll really be able to help the breeding herd because it will decrease the over po overall positivity of the region. You know, follow, following up on that a little bit, uh, we're, winter is here, right? And, but it has been kind of <clears throat> one month delayed right, both in terms of temperature and in terms of disease uh, detection. But we can't cross our arms, right? As Guilherme said, the city's values are still low out there with this lineage uh, 1.5 still, still spreading. And so from your viewpoint, can you elaborate more on, on what, from what you see and hear? What are the, some of the non-negotiable practices to avoid that uh, pathogen spread and, and uh, keep the herds free of as, as much as they can be? So some non-negotiable practices that we really apply within our system overall to essentially decrease the potential activity of pathogens is really around downtime and essentially transportation has been really a huge focus for us. Um, so downtime can apply to people, visitors, supplies. So ensuring that all of those items have the appropriate downtime, they should be at the site that they're arriving at and that the individuals or materials weren't at another location that they shouldn't have been prior. And the idea is in some of that, right, it's to reduce the total viral load that shows up to the sow unit. And if mm -hmm. the wrong, you know, items or people show up, it's to stop them before they actually enter the sow unit or the wean to finish site because we apply the same practices there across the system. Um, and then a bigger thing for us too has really been transportation biosecurity here lately in the focus of, you know, having no dirty trailer show up, practicing rejecting trailers and not accepting that, oh, well, it's just a little piece of organic material because if it's a little piece now, it'll be a bigger piece later. Um, so that's really something that we've spent a lot of time within our region mm -hmm. trying to, you know, control the things we can control. Very good. Well, Dr. Mason, thanks for your time and answering our questions. It was a really great discussion. And thanks, everyone who is watching. See you guys next month. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.